In the summertime, much of the storage yard was taken up with a large garden filled with rows of tomato plants. There was a stone bird bath and a latticework trellis that was heavy with climbing sweet peas and tremulous cucumber vines. The Story sisters could have had small separate bedrooms on the first floor, but they chose to share the attic. They preferred one another's company to rooms of their own. And when Annie heard them behind the closed doors, whispering conspiratorially to each other in that secret vocabulary of theirs, she felt left out in some deep, hurtful way. Her oldest girl sat up in the hawthorn tree late at night, and she said she was looking at stars, but she was there even on cloudy nights, her black hair black against the sky. And Annie was certain that people who said daughters were easy had never had girls of their own. Today, the Story Sisters were all in blue, teal and azure and sapphire. They liked to wear similar clothes and confuse people as to who was who. Usually they wore jeans and t-shirts, but this was a special occasion. They adored their grandmother, Natalia, whom they called Amma, a name Elv had bestowed upon her as a toddler. Their Amma was Russian and elegant and wonderful. She'd fallen in love with their grandfather in France, and although the Rosens lived on 89th Street, they kept their apartment where Natalia had lived as a young woman in the Marais district of Paris. As far as the Story sisters were concerned, it was the most wonderful place in the world. Annie and the girls visited once a year, and they were infatuated with Paris. They had dreams of long days filled with creamy light and meals that lasted long into the hazy blur of evening. They loved French ice cream, and they studied beautiful women and tried to imitate the way they walked, the way they tied their scarves. They always traveled to France for spring vacation. The chestnut tree in the courtyard was in bloom then with its scented white flowers. The plaza was probably the second best place in the world. Annie went to the girls' room to find her daughters clustered around the window, gazing at the horse-drawn carriages down below. From a certain point of view, the sisters looked like women, tall and beautiful and poised, but they were still children in many ways, the younger girls especially. Meg was saying that when she got married, she wanted to ride in one of those carriages. She would wear a white dress and carry a hundred roses. The girl's secret world was called Arnell. Arnish for rose was Minta. It was the single word that Annie understood. Alana Misora Minta, Meg was saying. Roses, wherever you looked. How can you think about that now? Elv gestured out the window. She was easily outraged and hated mistreatment of any sort. Those carriage horses are malnourished. Elv had always been an animal fanatic. Years ago, she'd found a rabbit mortally wounded by a lawnmower's blade, left to bleed to death in the velvety grass of the Weinstein's lawn. She tried her best to nurse it back to health, but in the end, the rabbit had died in a shoebox covered up by a doll's blanket. Afterwards, she and Meg and Claire had held a funeral, but Elf had been inconsolable. If we don't take care of the creatures who have no voice, she'd whispered to her sisters, then who will? She tried to do exactly that. She left out seeds for morning doves, opened cans of tuna fish for stray cats, set out packets of sugar for the garden moths. She had begged for a dog, but her mother had neither the time nor the patience for a pet. Annie wasn't about to disrupt their home life. She would no desire to add another personality to the mix, not even that of a terrier or a spaniel. Now at the window at the plaza, as they brooded over the fate of the horses, Elv was telling her sisters about love. The Arnish were appalled at mortal love. It was a weak brew compared to true Arnish passion. Your beloved in Arnell would do anything to save you. He'd be willing to be slashed by knives, tied to trees, torn into a bloody heap. But what if you're in love like Amma and Grandpa, Meg asked, when the rules of love were recounted. They had the comfortable sort of love where they finished each other's sentences, and it was impossible to imagine their grandfather tied to a tree. Then you're doomed to be human, Elf said sadly. Well, maybe I'd prefer that. Meg was getting fed up with Arnell. If she wanted to enter an other world, all she had to do was open a novel. Elf shook her head. There were some things that her practical middle sister would never understand. 
Meg had no idea what human beings were really like, and Elf hoped she never found out. And as for Claire, she could not look away from the street. Now all she could see were the carriage horse's ribs sticking out, the foam around their mouths, the way they limped as they trotted off. There was a spell that Elf had taught her one night. Meg was up in the room reading, so it was just the two of them in the garden. Ever since the gypsy moth summer, they'd left Meg out of their most intimate plans. The spell, the spell that Elv taught Claire that night was a call for protection. You were only to use it when it was absolutely necessary. Elv took a trowel from their mother's garden shed, where there were spiders and bags of mulch, and she drew the sharp edge across the palm of her hand. She let her blood drip into the soil. Nam brava gig, she whispered. Ryuna Mallon. My brave sister, rescue me. All Claire had to do was say that, and Elv would be there. But what if you're too far away to hear me, Claire had asked. Their own garden seemed strange at night. There were white moths and the soil looked black. Claire didn't want to think about the things that lived under the weeds. They'd seen a creepy crawly there once that was as big as her hand. It had had a thousand legs. I'll hear you. Elf's hand was still bleeding, but it didn't seem to hurt. I'll find you wherever you are. So that's the beginning of the story, sisters. Um, things get more complicated after that. Thanks.